Yeah. Welcome home. Welcome to the Journey Church. Happy Sunday. Happy Easter. We are so excited that you chose to celebrate with us the greatest event in the history of the world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. Jesus defeated death. The resurrection of Jesus changed everything. In fact, the resurrection declares that Jesus is the goat. Jesus is the greatest of all time. All time. Oh, no, no golf clapping. No golf clapping. You're going to clap. Yeah. If you are watching online or from the outreach center, or maybe in the overflow, happy Easter. If you are wa watching Facebook Live, hit that share button. Down in the bottom right corner, you have no idea. Someone could watch today's message and their life could be changed forever. Yeah. Jesus is the goat. He, he has no equal, no rival. There, there's no debate. The argument was settled 2,019 years ago when he conquered death. His resume speaks for itself. And I get it. Maybe you're here today and you are searching and seeking for the answer to life. You're not sure about the Bible. You're not sure about God or Jesus. You are still looking for evidence. If that's you, we're glad you're here. You are why the journey church exists. In fact, I want to share with you seven I am statements that proves that Jesus is the greatest of all time. Jesus is the great I am. If you have a Bible or the Bible app on your mobile device, grab it, tap it, punch it. Power it up and go to the book of John where I believe Jesus submits his resume of greatness. Seven I am statements. Number one, Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever. In other words, open invitation for anyone from anywhere who's done anything. Anything. Whoever what follows me will not walk in darkness. Do you understand we are born into darkness? We are born into depravity, separated from a holy God. But Jesus said, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Number two, Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear what? Much fruit. Well, what does that mean? It means there will be evidence that Jesus lives inside of you. You cannot come to Jesus and remain the same. It's impossible. Why? Because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you if you are a Christ follower. He said you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. Number three, Jesus said in John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. The, the resurrection is irrefutable evidence that Jesus kicked down the door of death. He said, I am the resurrection and the life, the one, the person who believes. The person who, who places their entire trust in me will live even though they die. Newsflash, you have an appointment with death. The Bible says no one can escape the power of the grave. It's, it's statistically proven that 10 out of every 10 people die. One day, you are going to take your last breath on hotel earth and spend eternity somewhere. 
And, and here's the deal. If you leave planet Earth without Jesus, one second after you die, you're going to wish you were never born. That's how important a relationship with Jesus is. And I get it. Some of you might be thinking, preacher, Pastor Daryl, dude, what is a resurrection? A resurrection is when something or someone dies, then comes back to life, defeats death. In 2001, I saw what I thought was a resurrection. It wasn't a person. It was a deer. <laughs> And no, I, I don't like hunting, okay? I'm, I'm a Bambi fan, okay? And, and so, but I, I was driving my brother's truck in Fort Clinch to check on my Sunday school boys who were camping out. And, and I was going, I, I don't know, maybe 15 to 20 miles per hour. And all of a sudden, this deer came out of nowhere and bam! I mean, bam! I hit the deer. <laughs> oh, I was like freaking out. Like, oh my gosh, I just hit that. Oh, oh. So I back up to see what the damage is. And, and the deer is just laying there motionless. Blood is running out of its mouth. I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, what should I do? What should I do? Should I get out and lay hands on it? <laughs> God, God, heal this deer. I, I read somewhere that if you pray in Jesus' name, you have to do it. And, and by the way, we, we should have had that in stupid things Christians say because <laughs> it's not true, Okay. You can't back God into a corner. There's no formula, all right? Uh, should, I, should, I, should I pray over this deer? And all of a sudden, this deer just stands up, looks at me, and throws up one hoof and runs into the woods. <laughs> Some of you go, one hoof? <laughs> That's what you do in traffic, right, when somebody cuts you off? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, let's be real. Got your Jesus sticker. <laughs> and I get it. Stupid story, right? Because the deer wasn't dead. But Jesus did die. He was crucified. He, he was executed for our sin. But he also conquered death. He defeated death. Understand, if Jesus had not defeated death, turn out the lights, go home, the party's over. This book right here, just throw it in the garbage. If there's one lie in this book, throw it all away. There's no reason to be here, but there's a reason to be here because Jesus did defeat death. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. But when Jesus said this in John chapter 11, he was talking about a man named Lazarus who also died, but he didn't stay dead either. So here's what I want to do. I want to camp out for just a few minutes on this story because I believe there's some people in this room, uh, in, in the overflow online, uh, at the outreach center who are Christ followers, but you are dealing with what seems like a dead situation in your life. And if that's you, I want to remind you, Jesus has the power to bring dead things back to life. I think I need to say that one more time. Jesus has the power to bring dead things back to life. In our story in John chapter 11, uh, the Bible says in verse 1, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. I mean, he, he is so sick, he's about to die. The Bible says he was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. So, so the sisters sent word to Jesus. They sent someone to tell Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now, let's hit the pause button on this story for just a moment. Because I realize there's some people in this room online at the outreach center and, and, and you are celebrating great things God is doing in this season of life. I mean, you, you are living on the mountaintop. But I also realize there's some people in this room online outreach center who are hurting right now. You, you walked in here hurting because someone you love is sick. Someone you love is fighting for their life. Maybe recently you lost your job, or maybe your dream marriage turned into divorce. Or maybe your, your prodigal child or children are running from God. Or, or maybe for some of you, it's just a dark and difficult season of life. 
Mary and Martha sent Jesus a message. In our time, it would be they sent him a text message, an email. And they said, the one you love is sick, really, really sick. And Jesus says something, go God, amazing in verse 4. Watch this. When Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. No, sir, it is for what? God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. What is Jesus saying? He's saying he's about to bring glory to himself through the most devastating news you and I could ever imagine. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to Pastor Darrell paraphrase the next 10 verses. However, I want to encourage you, go home and read uh, read it later. Basically, everybody believed Jesus was going to save the day, but Jesus did absolutely nothing. For two days, he didn't do anything. They're freaking out, and he's hanging out. Then two days later, he says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. And his disciples were were like, heck to the no, bro. No, not a chance. If you go back there, everybody's going to try to kill you. But Jesus said, we need to go back because Lazarus has fallen asleep. And I need to wake him up. Side note, Lazarus wasn't taking a nap. Jesus was using a metaphor for the boy is dead. Lazarus is dead and I need to raise him back to life. Now, don't drift. Stay with me. Because I want you to pay close attention to Thomas, one of Jesus' disciples, as well as Mary and Martha. Because all three of these people were dying on the inside. In fact, let's start with Thomas, who was dead in his doubt. Now, if you grew up in church or Sunday school, you probably flannel graphed Thomas, right? You know him as Doubting Thomas. And verse 16 is one of the verses where he got his nickname. Watch this. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus. (laughs) I think I'd stick with Thomas, right? (laughs) Sounds like a bad rapper name, Didymus. Sorry. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, watch this, let us also go, that we may die with him. (laughs) A little sarcasm, but a lot of doubt. Thomas is doubting. He's thinking this is not a good deal. This is not going to work out. This is not going to work out in the end. I wonder how many of you walked through these doors today and would admit I've had or I've got spiritual doubt in my life. Raise your hand. My hand is up. If you've got spiritual doubt or ever had spiritual doubt. Now, I don't know. Maybe you can wax your halo for a minute while I talk to the real people. (laughs) If you didn't raise your hand. You see, here's what I know. Some of you prayed a prayer. And you believed God could and he would come through. But he didn't. And now you are bombarded with thoughts of doubt. Thoughts like, why didn't God answer my prayers the way I prayed them? Or maybe you grew up in a Christian home, then went off to college, and some professor told you the Bible isn't true. That one God creating the universe is a scam. And all of a sudden, your parents' faith was not strong enough to overcome your doubt. Or perhaps you, you believed, you, you, you truly believed in God until something bad happened to someone you loved. So now you think if God is good, that would have never happened. If God is all powerful, he, he, he would have stepped in and saved the day. But he didn't. And now you find yourself like Thomas. On the inside, you are dead in your doubts. Or maybe for some of you, you are more like Mary, who was dead in discouragement. You you don't see anything good happening in your life. The glass is always half empty. You, You can't seem to get a break. Mary was so overwhelmed with discouragement, she stayed home when Jesus arrived. Did you know that? Look at verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. And I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm reading into this too much, but uh, she, she went out to meet him, not greet him. And so we'll revisit that. But Mary stayed home. You know what Mary's thinking? Why bother? He's already dead. There's nothing Jesus can do about this situation. Is that you today? 
Are you so overwhelmed with discouragement that you believe your circumstances are unchangeable? Is that your thought process? I'm always going to feel alone. I'm always going to be depressed. I'm always going to be stuck in this dead-end job, this dead-end marriage, this dead-end addiction. I wonder how many of you walk in here stuck in discouragement, stuck in depression, doubt. And no, it's not visible with your new Easter outfit and fake smile. It's hidden on the inside. But when someone asks you, how are you doing? Your bogus answer is, oh, I'm good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> right, glory to God. He is risen. Jesus is alive. But on the inside, you are dead in discouragement. Thomas was dead in doubt. Mary was dead in discouragement. And Martha was dead in the delay. In other words, she was thinking, Jesus, why did you take so long? You could have come back earlier. But you didn't come back. You could have changed the situation. Look at verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for how long? Four days. The boy is dead. Not breathing dead. Cold, stiff. Like the smell of death is still in the air. Lazarus was so dead, Martha would later tell Jesus his body smelled terrible. In the King James Version, she said, he, he, he stinketh. <laughs> For you King James, you know, KJV people, he stinketh. When I was growing up about 10 years ago, <laughs> why y'all laughing? <clears throat> right? We used the word stanky. <laughs> well, you stank. You need to take a shower because you are stanky. No, I thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> Martha said to Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't be dead. You could have done something about this. Can you relate today? Is that you? Do you find yourself dead in the delay? Waiting on an answer prayer from God? Maybe for some of you young ladies, it's marriage. You, you think my, my biological clock is ticking. I, I'm 25. I, I, I'm almost 30. I, I need to get married. Somebody needs to put a ring on it. Right? Your thought process is, I've been faithful to God, but nothing is happening. All my friends who are clubbing and doing the jiggy jig are getting married, right? <laughs> but I'm always the bridesmaid. No hubby, no jiggy jig for me. Right? You, you, you feel dead in the delay. Some of you married couples are praying for a baby, but you can't seem to conceive. You, you've been praying, maybe you even fasted and believing God for a child, but nothing has happened. Some of you are praying and believing for God to heal your spouse, your husband, your wife, a, a family member, a mom, a dad, a friend. And you believe God is a God of the impossible. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is our healer, yet God seems silent. So you feel dead in the delay. Listen, I don't know what delay you are dealing with today, but this I do know. God's delays are not always denials. God's delays are not always denials. Just because God hasn't done something yet doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan for the future. It doesn't mean he doesn't have a plan for the future. In fact, as I was, I was reading this story over and over this week, it hit me. All of the bad stuff happened on one page. Lazarus died. Thomas freaked out and doubted. Mary's discouraged. Martha is mad. And then I turned the page and everything shifted. Look at verse 22. Someone needs this. I needed this this past week. Martha said, I know that even now. Look at your neighbor and tell them, even now now even now i know that even now god will give you whatever you ask and and i get it we need to be very careful not to create a theology off of one verse because we know by reading the rest of the bible that if our will doesn't line up with god's will we, we can ask all day long but i think sometimes as christians we're so afraid of the outcome 
We're afraid to even ask God for the supernatural. We're afraid to ask God to, to do a miracle in our life. Martha looks at Jesus and says, even now. I wonder how many of you walked in here today in need of an even now moment with God. And no, I don't know what your even now uh, moment is, but I want to pray for you. I want to pray that God will turn your discouragement, your doubt, your delay into a testimony of God's glory over the dead things in your life. Jesus said in verse 25, look at this. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Notice Jesus did not say, I am able to resurrect. No, sir. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Newsflash. The resurrection is not just something Jesus did. It's who he is. It's who he is. Truth. Download this into your heart and soul today. The resurrection is not an event. It's a person and his name is Jesus. And when Jesus walks into a dead situation, dead things don't say dead. They don't say dead. Look at verse 43. The Bible says Jesus called out in a loud voice. Why a loud voice? I have no idea. Maybe dead people don't hear well. Some people who are alive don't hear well, right? But Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And guess what happened? Death became life. You see, here's the truth. Many of you walked in here hurting, trapped in a tomb of discouragement, a tomb of doubt, a tomb of delay. And honestly, your faith is faithless right now. Your hope is hopeless right now. And the truth is, you don't have the strength to roll the stone away because you are overwhelmed with doubt, overwhelmed with discouragement, overwhelmed in the delay. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you today. So in an act of faith, if you need prayer, would you please just raise your hand? Pastor, would you pray for me today? Just hold them up just for a moment in an act of faith. Thank you. You can put them down. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, you are a good, good father. And God, you are so much bigger than our problems. In fact, you are the problem solver. You, you know every intimate detail of our lives. So Father, I pray that you would intervene even now. In every situation of these people's life, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would bring peace that goes beyond their ability to understand their situation. Father, some of these people are stuck in discouragement. Some are stuck in depression. Some, some are stuck in doubt. Others in uh, an, an addiction. While others are dealing with delay. And, and Father, they all need a touch from you. And, and I get it, God. We live in a broken world where everything is not perfect. Everyone is not healed on, on this side. And, and life is not always fair. Father, I get that. But your word also declares, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Therefore, I believe the same voice that called Lazarus to come out of the grave can call people out of their dead situations. So, Father, I pray for the change of discouragement, the change of depression, the change of doubt, and the change of delay to become testimonies of your faithfulness. And Father, I pray this in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's wrap this up. You ready? Number four, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's what Jesus did. You, you see, they did not take his life. The Bible says he laid it down as a ransom for our sins. Number five, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I get it, we live in a world, a culture where people believe, oh, there's just many ways to God. No, there's not. Amen. There's one way. One way, and that's it. And, and when Jesus said this, it wasn't an announcement of condemnation. It was an invitation filled with compassion to experience the Father's love. 
So, so don't get so caught up in there's only one way. Be thankful there is a way. Be grateful there is a way. Jesus said, number six, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You see, here's the truth. Nothing in this world can satisfy that emptiness inside of your soul. Money can't do it. Power can't do it. Success can't do it. Sex can't do it. Nothing in this world can satisfy your soul. Oh, it might for a season, but when you lay your head on, the, on your pillow at night, you are still empty inside. You're still empty. Listen, there's only one person who can fill that empty void inside of you, and his name is Jesus. Therefore, the only logical conclusion for every one of us is, is to step into a relationship with Jesus. Number seven, Jesus said, yes, I am the gate. I am the door. Those who come through me will be saved. I want every head bowed, every eye closed. And I get it, this was not your typical Easter message. But I wonder on this Easter weekend 2019, if there's someone here today that's never experienced the life-changing, transforming power of Jesus. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. The Bible says in Revelation, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. You see, here's the truth. Some of you walked in here spiritually dead in your sin. The Bible says we're all born dead in our sins, for all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible, the Bible also says you must be born again, talking about a spiritual rebirth. Please understand, I'm not peddling religion or trying to push Jesus down your throat. I just want you to know we are not born bad people who need to become better. No, sir, we are dead people who need to be brought back to life. How? Through Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You see, God would rather give up his son than give up on you. That's how much God loves you. And you think, well, someone invited me here today. No, you're here because God ordained it. And the life's, life's greatest question is what will you do with Jesus? Question, has there ever been a time when you surrendered your life to Jesus and you were never the same again? Understand, I did not ask you, uh, are you a member of some church? Did you say a prayer and walk an aisle? I'm asking you, has there been a time in your life when you surrendered your life, you waved the white flag, and your life has never, ever been the same again? Listen, if you walked an aisle, said a prayer, got baptized, but nothing changed, you missed it. I am here to declare you missed it. Don't think that you're okay because you're not okay. Some of you need to move from head knowledge to a heart relationship. You need to make it personal. So if you are ready to turn from your sins and walk out of darkness into light, I, I want to give you that opportunity. And I'm going to give you a prayer that you can pray, but this prayer does not save you. It doesn't. You're not praying to this pastor or this church. You are praying to the creator of the universe, the creator of your soul. And so if you are here and ready to say yes to Jesus, just pray this prayer. You can pray it out loud. You can pray it in your heart of hearts. Father, I, I am ready to give you my whole heart. I admit I am a sinner and I need forgiveness. Jesus, save me. Forgive me. Change me. Make me new. I commit my entire life to you. My life is no longer my own. It now belongs to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me so I could live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With heads still bowed and eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand? Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. I've given my life to Jesus Christ. Hold them up high. Please hold up your hands high. We have leaders in the room who want to hand you a Bible. 
inside that Bible, there's a card for you to fill out. If you haven't received a Bible, please keep your hand in the air until you receive a Bible. In the overflow, if you gave your life to Christ, just talk to one of our pastors in the room. They will get you a Bible online. If, if you prayed that prayer, you gave your life to Christ, Outreach Center. Um, online, just, just say, hey, I gave my life to Christ. Someone will follow up with you. Anyone else, I, I prayed that prayer today, Pastor. I, I gave my life to Christ. Anyone else? Can we celebrate what God has done today? <laughs> Praise God. Now, last assignment before our worship team leads us in one last song. When you leave here, those of you who just gave your life to Christ, one of our leaders is going to stop you and get your information. Okay? We're not going to send you crazy emails. If they got bad breath, they're going to throw a tic-tac in. Okay? Let them get your information. We want to help you with your next step. This is just the first step step into this new relationship with God through Jesus. And so if someone sees you carrying this Bible, they're going to stop you and say, hey, can I get your information? Because we want to follow up with you. We want to help you become the person God created you to become. Amen? Amen. So don't be freaked out when someone says, hey, I see that you have a Bible. Can, can I talk to you for just a few minutes? All right, let's stand to our feet and worship one last time, giving God praise.